Morning, everyone. Welcome to the lookout. I'm going to talk about the Dixie Fire here. We're going to start off looking at the southeast corner of the fire. <coughs> 395 runs across the bottom of this. We're looking pretty much to the west, a little bit south. The highway 70 is running from the um, left hand of the fire, or left hand of the screen towards the center. Uh, Portola is kind of above and to the left of center. So what's going on here is that the fire made a big run that we've been talking about um, over the past five or six days out to the east. Ran about 20 miles and gained about uh, 30,000 acres. And it ran up towards the desert. So, you know, in the, in the distance there we see Honey Lake and Pyramid Lake and uh, out in Nevada. So the fire ran out towards Herlong. We had really strong winds for about three days. Um, the Beckworth fire burned earlier this year in July, and that's in the bottom left of the screen here in a pale color. So what happened is once the fire stopped um, getting a bunch of wind on it, it kind of hung up here on the edge of the escarpment. And the thing that's um, significant about the escarpment here, this is the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada mountains. And it's also the watershed divide between the Feather River and the desert. And this area is really notorious with firefighters because um, when we've got heat in the desert rising up, uh, it creates kind of a local area of low pressure and it draws winds down this uh, escarpment. So it's really common in the summertime to get incredible kind of downslope afternoon winds on the escarpment. And in the past, that's caused major firefighter injuries. And um, so people, you know, we all get trained that Highway 395 is a really dangerous place to fight fire, pretty much anywhere on the east side of the Sierra, but especially here around Honey Lake. Um, but what's going on right now is that the weather's cooled off a bit, and um, we haven't had those escarpment winds over the past several days. So we've been kind of expecting that this fire was going to just blast down the escarpment, and we'd have a real fight here at Highway 395. It, it hasn't really happened. Um, in the meantime, after this big run, uh, yesterday, you know, the day before yesterday, the fire um, it made a really skinny long run, and yesterday it kind of widened up. Um, or the day before yesterday, it got wider in the middle of here. And then yesterday we got some winds from the northeast, and that blew the fire back the other direction. So one thing we were talking about on the lookout was just that um, firefighting in the desert is different from firefighting on the west side of the mountains. It's different from fighting fire in the valley. Uh, one thing that we learn in the desert is just that um, winds can change radically all the time. So basically what happened yesterday was the winds did a 90 degree shift from being a little more northerly to being more out of the east. What that did is it blew the fire back several miles back towards Lake Davis and Portola. So the black lines on this map are all dozer lines and places that the fire's kind of been checked up. Uh, you notice, you know, we've been talking about whether or not those are lined, where, where they work and where they don't. They work when the wind's blowing away from them or when the fire's running parallel to them. It's a lot harder for the, those are lines to hold up when the fire's blowing towards them just because of the spotting we're having. Anyway, so we'll see around the le left hand bottom side here that the fire is pretty much held up on the dozer lines along the ridges and flanks that got fired over the past few days. But the fire now is burning back towards Portola. So Portola is here in the foreground of the image. Uh, last night it was about 10 or 11 miles from the fire's recent spread. Grizzly Ranch is a fairly uh, major kind of resort community, golf courses and a lot of homes. That's closer, that's about seven miles away from the fire. So there's, um, now that we're moving into kind of our north and east wind season, there's a real threat, you know, a credible threat that the fire could kind of come back in the back door around this area that we've already secured and cause some real problems. So big emphasis here on containing the west side of this fire. Uh, every time we have a, a pattern shift, you know, a, a low pressure or high pressure, um, anytime we have a, a weather system that's going to move through, we're going to have changeable winds here. And it's just um, it's a really tough place to fight fire under the current conditions. And one of the advantages we do have is that we've got some big meadows here. Um, 
disadvantage we have here is just that these runs have been so extreme that um, staying fighting fire in this dynamic kind of environment. You know, if once the w fire started to push back towards the west, firefighters are working hard on this flank, and the fire continues to spread to the south. So it's kind of a game of whack-a-mole, and figuring out what's going on and redeploying firefighters in the middle of the day under dynamic circumstances is really challenging. And I know I've, I've seen a lot of comments of people saying, how come we just don't get more firefighters here and put the fire out? And it's because we have major fires burning in northwestern California, we have major fire of the Caldor fire that's had the potential to be one of the worst urban interface disasters California has seen. You know, the, the Caldor had the potential to make the campfire and the burning of paradise um, look kind of minor. So another comment on that um, is just that under these current conditions, we could have all the firefighters that are on the Caldor, and it's, there's no guarantee that we would be able to, to keep this fire from doing what it wants to do. Uh, with long-range spotting, um, you've seen that you know 2,000 miles of dozer line can't hold this fire. Um, so uh, I think just the thing to keep in mind is that there are real limits in our ability to control fire, um, especially under our new normal of drought and warmer temperatures. And that um, rather than criticize the, the, um, the government of not doing enough to put the fires out, that we should um, be having a conversation about what we do now. Now that we see fires like this that are beyond our control. And uh, let's talk about whether or not, um, you know, I think there's a lot of pressure when things like this happen to double down and buy more air tankers and um, spend more money on the same approaches that we've been using. And um, there's no guarantee that that will change the outcome. So uh, we gotta got to work smarter, not harder, right? Um, I'm not sure why this is erasing my dose lines, but um, this fire here that we've been talking about a while by Bogard, um, after pushing to the, uh, kind of similarly to what's happening on the southeast part of the fire, this fire has been pushing here um, towards Highway 44 for days. Um, now it's changed its mind and it's it's heading north. Uh, we've got a bunch of dozer line out in front of that. Um, it's getting spots in front of it. Um, continues just to be problematic and. You know, as soon as we start thinking that we've got a contain on the north, they'll probably run in some other direction. Uh, just challenging conditions. Coming around the top end of the fire, um, we're looking at Lassen Park in purple, and um, Butte Lake is um, kind of towards the. Uh, well, let's skip that. Um, Caribou Wilderness is on the left in green. And we've been talking about this area here by the, um, the reading fire. I got some information from a um, retired Forest Service firefighter that's been watching what's going on here, saying that the, um, the fire spread, as we've been talking about in the reading fire, um, the reading fire is mainly full of kind of green, what we call buckbrush or ceanothus. And there's just not enough fuel in there after nine years of it growing to really carry the fire very well. And we've seen here that the fire is barely really spread unless it's really had you know some alignment with winds. But you know, like yesterday out in here, um, fire spread about 300 feet over the course of 24 hours. But there, as we've talked about, there's some real pressure to, to tie off this end of the fire. You know, nobody likes to have fire just hanging uncontained. And so a few days ago, um, there were firing operations um, along the northern boundary, and they just they didn't really get the uh, consumption they want. And what we what we hate to do is have incomplete combustion. If we come in here and we light this, and conditions aren't dry enough for it to burn all the way to black, we haven't really secured anything. If there's still islands of unburned fuel in there, so um, you know, kind of one nightmare scenario for hot shots is you start doing a burning operation you get halfway through and an air tanker comes and like drops on it because they think that that's they don't know that you're there and then you've got this dirty burn that you're, you're your tool your main tool of being able to burn it out to get rid of the fuel is suddenly taken away from you so they they've held up firing here for a couple of days because they um, couldn't get the kind of consumption they wanted in this green fuel in the blue side of this polygon 
Um, there's some firing on the interior, it looks like, um, and that's spread now out to the west. So that's kind of forcing the firefighters' hands. Like they have to figure out how to burn this out um, or they have to figure out how to have a direct attack and put out the piece of fire here that uh, that's burning towards the line that's uncontained. So it's just another one of those no-win situations where, you know, um, the person that I was talking to about this said that maybe the plan was to bring in what we call a terror torch, which is basically a flamethrower um, that you use to create a whole bunch of heat and see if we could get it going with that. But as we've seen elsewhere on the side of the fire line here that's not blue, there's heavy fuel that's dry and receptive to spotting and will give us all the same problems that we've had firing nearby. So um, I'd like to hear more from people um, who know what's going to go on here. You know, I'm, I'm kind of running on secondhand information, and uh, but it seems clear that you know something needs to be done to tie up this end of the fire. And if we can't fire out ahead of it, um, and we can't go direct on it, you know, we don't have that many options. So it's kind of an unfolding piece of the story, and uh, we'll keep you posted on what happens there. Anyway, that's about it for the Dixie Fire. Um, we're also writing about this on the Lookout blog, um, d-lookout.org. Put a link in the bio. And um, as I've said before, you know, we welcome information from anyone who knows what's going on. Um, that's you know someone that we can validate as a, a trusted source. Um, so send us your tips. Um, you can find a link to, s to email us on the lookout. Thanks, and uh, hope everyone has a good weekend.